Well, hey, everybody. It is so good to be back with you after a long and fun and eventful trip uh, to see our friends and mission partners in Guatemala. Uh, we made it back. And that's, that was fun. We, we almost thought we weren't going to. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the pastor here. If we haven't met for your first, second time and we haven't met, I'd love to get to meet you at some point today. But uh, I want to tell you uh, one really quick thing and then one other better thing. The first really quick thing is this. We're kicking off a brand new series today that we're calling Letters. And here's what Letters is all about. Here's what it's all about. Imagine if in your life you probably had a mentor at some point in your life. and where There were times when you didn't know what to do. Right? And you had this mentor, somebody that you would call. Maybe for you it was, it was a parent. But maybe for you it was a teacher. Maybe for you it was a, a boss at work or a former uh, boss at work or somebody who was kind of a colleague but just knew you really well. A friend who, who was a little further down the parenting path than you and, and spoke in your life. That's one of the things we, we hope is happening in our church. That those of you who have, are a little bit further down uh, life's journey, that you look back at people like me and, and younger than me and you're able to give us wisdom. We want to hear from you, by the way. We want those things. Well, about 2,000 years ago, uh, there was these two guys. Uh, one's named Timothy and one's named Titus. And Timothy and Titus were pastors in these fledgling churches that had started up. And they were trying to get things going, but they were having a little bit of trouble because they didn't have what we know as the New Testament and, and the Bible at the time uh, to help them walk through. They didn't know what to do. And so they did the only thing they knew to do. They asked their mentor, a guy named Paul. And they said, Paul, what do we do? They sent emissaries to him and said, what do we do? And Paul wrote back some letters. And we have them still to this day. We know them as 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So what we're going to do all summer is we're going to look at these letters. Because truthfully, in church life, we don't usually spend a lot of time looking at these letters. But they have all kinds of importance to us. All kinds of importance to us. Right? He's not just saying, here's how you go be a pastor. He's also saying, here's how you follow Jesus. And here's what you need to be telling your people when it comes to following Jesus. We don't spend a lot of time in these letters unless we're like pulling up verses to tell women they can't preach or we're putting on a verse on our youth group shirt, right? Like, those are really the only times you hear anything out of these verses. But I want us to dive headlong into it and see exactly what Paul is talking about. And in order to do that, to kick it off, I've asked my friend Matt Steen uh, to come with me. He's been standing back here awkwardly. Sorry. Um, <laughs> how's good. my back look? Great. Good. Actually, it looks good. Uh, thanks. I try. Lint roll and everything. Um, so this is my friend Matt. Matt um, is one of, our, one of the guys I've gotten to know here in Orlando. He, is, uh, he used to serve on staff in churches. Now he helps churches um, find staff uh, for their staff. Yeah. To find <laughs> staff for their churches. So um, he knows, like, everybody, and it's really fun to talk to him about, about these things. But he's here because uh, he went to the greatest seminary in the world, Truett Seminary. Let's do the Truett, yeah, Truett Dap. Um, <laughs> we're not going that far. Uh, but uh, Truett Seminary, and he knows all sorts of stuff, and he's going to tell us all about First Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. So give it up for my friend Matt. No, no pressure there. So, well, as Josh said, my name is Matt Steen, and, and Church on the Drive, I'm so grateful to be here. Thanks for, for allowing me to come and spend some time with you this morning. Um, uh, like Josh said, I'm Matt, my wife, Teresa, and my three-year-old greyhound, Nellie. Uh, we live over in Lake Nona area, and so it's good to be able to partner with churches and, and spend time with churches in our area that are they're doing such great work for the, for the gospel. Um, my... My dog Nellie made sure that I was, would let you know that she is actually tuning in online right now. And so Nellie and everybody else that's joining us online, we're so grateful that you're here as well. So I'm, I'm excited, you know, even though Josh just dropped a whole lot of pressure on me, um, I'm pretty excited about being here this morning because this, this series on, on the letters of Paul, I, I think are so applicable to what we're, what we're living out today, right? And I'm excited for you guys because over the course of these next few months, you're going to be able to spend some time with Paul's protégés, Timothy and Titus. You're going to be able to listen in as he guides them through their life and their ministry and, and, and talks a little bit about how to interact with a, with a culture that may not necessarily be the most friendly to the Christian world. And so this is, this is pretty exciting to me. And, and what's also exciting to me is I love letters. 
You know, I watched the bumper video and that was awesome and it kind of stirred something up in me because um, I, I get, I, I have this probably unhealthy obsession with getting letters. You know, Teresa thinks I'm nuts because for, for, for the entire length of our marriage, I um, get anxious around the time when the mail comes. I, I've been known to um, body check people out of the way on the way to the mailbox because I need to get the letters first. And, and, and while it's probably a little bit unhealthy, for a 40-something-year-old man to have this kind of obsession with anything, much less the mailbox, uh, I think some of you might understand a little bit about this, right? So if you, um, if, if you, look, in, if you look in my closet, and this is, this is for free, if you look in my closet, you'll notice a, a giant box filled with letters that I've gotten through the years. Okay, and there's times where I might sneak in and kind of open it up and, and read through them again and be remembered of the relationship and, and take the advice that somebody had passed along to me. Um, and, and I love being able to, to go back into those. But missing from that box, missing from that box is probably one of the most surprising letters that I've ever gotten in my life. So over, over the summer of my sophomore year in high school, I went to a summer camp in, in Western Maryland. I grew up in the Baltimore area. And, and, and we'd spend a week at that camp canoeing all the rivers in the area. And every morning we would, we would come together, we'd eat breakfast, there'd be a mail call, and then we'd go off and you know, do the canoeing thing. And, and people would get care packages that wouldn't last very long. Other people would get you know, letters. Now, I would go because this is a week-long camp. I never really expected to get anything in the mail. But one Thursday, one Thursday, I got the shock of my life because in the, in the mail call was a white, nondescript envelope with no return address, and, and it, was, it was made out to me. And so, you know, having this unhealthy obsession with mail like I do, got kind of excited, ripped it open, and, and in there was, was a really simple letter. It said this. It said... Dear Matt, we've moved. Love, Mom and Dad. <laughs> now, at this point, I went from excitement to, um, I don't know, something different. <laughs> because serious questions were popping in my head, right? You know, the first thing is, did this really happen or is this a joke? And the fact that I even have to ask that probably tells you a good bit about my family. <laughs> I noticed that there's no return address. Should I be concerned? And then I started thinking, you know, how am I getting home, man? Anyhow. And so ultimately, I did, I did make it back home to the same house that I had left from. You know, my, my parents got a kick out of the letter. You know, they thought it was the funniest thing ever. I ultimately got the last laugh when the therapy bill started coming in. <laughs> but this morning, as we dive into the letters that, that Paul is sending Timothy, and particularly 1 Timothy, I'm wondering if Timothy didn't have a similar experience to the one that I had when he got my canoe camp letter. Imagine this. Timothy, you know, he, he had been asked by his, his mentor, Paul, to stay in Ephesus after he had left. Timothy was asked to stay there and to lead the local church, and he's a young man in his 20s, early 20s. And he had been in touch, like Josh said, through the years, infrequently, through letters uh, that he would send out and say, hey, help me think through this, and something would come back. And, and, and so Timothy is there. It's been about 15 years since he's seen Paul physically. And while they are infrequently communicating, he still is, is getting a letter from Paul, the Paul. Imagine the anticipation. Imagine the excitement. And so Paul sends him this letter that starts out like this. In 1 Timothy 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of our God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So far, so good, right? Everything, everything's going on, you know, swimmingly as we expect but then we get to verse three verse three says this as i urged you when i left and, and went into macedonia stay there in ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies 
Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They, will be, they, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Now, if I'm Timothy, I'm probably taking a deep gulp at this point. You know, my, my, my letters of, uh, uh, my feelings of receiving a letter from my mentor has quickly gone from excitement and anticipation to anxiety. In fact, if, 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 if Paul was sending Timothy a text message with these instructions, I, I bet that Timothy is considering a response something along the lines of, new phone, who this? Because he's being instructed to lean into some pretty difficult and pretty challenging and significant work. Let's dig into this a little bit, shall we? So I read through this passage, and the first thing that strikes me is the length of the introduction. Okay, now this is a little geeky seminary stuff, so bear with me, please. But, but many times, Paul's known to have some really flowery introductions. Okay, where he, where he makes shout-outs to old friends in the community that he's sending the letter to. He, he, he talks about how grateful he is for the way that, that, that the community is embracing the faith or the way that the addressee is growing and flourishing in their faith. And, and well, spoiler alert, sorry, um, when you get to 2 Timothy, you're going to see some of that, right? Paul talks about how often he prays for Timothy. He talks about how grateful he is for, for, for Timothy's faithfulness and the faithfulness of Timothy's family. He also mentions how badly he wants to come back and see Timothy. But not this letter. No, no, not this letter. Here, Paul is pretty quick and to the point. Let's read it again. He says this. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul gets down to business pretty quickly. Keeps it short and to the point. But even though it is a quick introduction, Paul's also making sure that people are realizing two things, okay? The first is that Paul is an apostle and has the God-given authority that comes with that role in the early church. And that's a, that's a pretty big deal. The second thing is this. Timothy is Paul's disciple. And Timothy is entrusted by Paul to be his representative in Ephesus. I think it's important to keep these in the back of our heads as we dig into what it is that Paul is instructing Timothy to do, okay? He's calling him to end the teaching of false doctrine within the church. And so when Paul left Ephesus for, for Macedonia, he instructed Timothy in his young age to remain behind and help lead the church. And this, this introduction, it does two things. It reminds and, and encourages Timothy to do what he's called to do but it also serves as an answer to the question which is going to come up. Who died and made you Paul? Well, Paul did. That makes that easy. And so let's, let's spend some time, let's revisit a little bit about what Paul is, is instructing Timothy to do this morning. But before we go there, let's, let's set a little bit of the, of the backdrop if we can. So Ephesus, it's located in modern day Turkey. It, it's, it's situated on an important trade route. That, that had significant influence in that area. And so this made it a, a really key place to, to start a church, to plant a church. The, the area um, had a significant Jewish population, but it also had a large temple devoted to Artemis. And so it's a, it's a city where there's, there's people of various backgrounds coming together, a mashup of cultures and religions and traditions that are all coming together. And this area, this city, had a significant influence on the, on the region around it, which is why it's such a strategic place to start a church and why Timothy's job is so important. But with all of this, this crash together of people, with this, with this mashup of different societies and cultures, it also presented some interesting challenges, right? 
So when it came to staying true to the teaching of Paul and the apostles in Christ, it, it was difficult to keep some of those cultural influences out. And so over the course of time, Paul and others, they, they, they noticed that impurities were creeping into the teachings of the, of the Ephesian church. And that gets us to here where Paul is calling Timothy to remind him that he's been deputized to do this very important job. So in, chapter, or in verse 3, we read this. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you can command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or, or, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things, they, they promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Now, Paul doesn't spend a whole awful lot of time explaining what the false teachers were teaching but our best understanding leads us to believe that there were those who were inside the church that were allowing some of the cultural influences of the region to, to creep in on the teachings of the church, right? And so Timothy was being asked to correct those who were pointing people back to focusing more on the Mosaic law than Christ's teaching. Or to correct those who were saying that you're not allowed to get married. Or, or, or go after those who were saying that the... Um, that Christ has already come back and the resurrection has already occurred. While we don't necessarily find the big C church of today wrestling through issues like these, we don't see churches telling you not to be married and we don't necessarily have to create, correct that or we're not, we're not seeing churches that are pushing people to the Mosaic law before, before Christ's teaching. I think if we look around ourselves, we can see that we're in a very similar season to the one that Timothy was experiencing, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest for a minute. The last few years have been tough for the capital C church, right? We've seen far too many scandals involving well-known pastors. We, we've, we've been at each other's throats over the way that we've approached the pandemic or racial unrest, or elections, or vaccines, and, and, and the body of Christ has become more and more divided and divisive. Am I wrong? I look around the Capital C Church today and I see a church that has allowed certain cultural teachings to creep in and affect who it's called us to be. And I believe that in the same way that Paul has called Timothy to correct false teachings, he's calling us to do the same. Now, I, I, know, I know what you're thinking. You're sitting there thinking, is this guy nuts? You know? I, I, I know Josh got in last night at 3 a.m., but I mean, I can't wait till he's back, right? <laughs> and, and I know I'm supposed to come in. I know what my job is. I'm supposed to come in, preach a sermon, Make sure that you're out in time to beat the Methodists to the best restaurants. <laughs> but bear with me here. Bear with me here. I don't think it's as bad as you're imagining. <laughs> I don't think it can be. But I think it's critically important for those who, of us who call ourselves followers of Christ in this day and age to wrestle with this. In verses 5 and 6, Paul shares something of, of crucial importance that I'd like to unpack if we can. This is, this is a verse that can really easily be blown by and not given a second thought. But I think it's crucial to how we approach some of these false teachings that we're commanded to correct. I think, culturally, I think, as individuals, it can be really easy to get caught up in the teaching of false doctrines. 
I think it can be really easy for us to be so hungry to, to correct and to shut down that those are, that are derailing the faith, so easy to go over to war with people who are trying to ruin the church, that we miss the bigger part, the bigger point that Paul is making in verse 5 and 6. And this is what he says. He says, the goal of this command is love. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. The goal of this command is love. The goal of the command is what? Love. love. Thank you. The goal of the command is not correction. The goal of command is, is not defending the faith from the evil people who are trying to mess everything up. The goal of the command is not to win theological debates. The goal of the command is love. People who know me know that I have a, a bit of a um, competitive streak. And as I've matured with age, I'm sure if you asked Teresha, she would tell you that this hasn't changed at all. <laughs> and I'm still an overgrown 12-year-old when it comes to this kind of thing. But that said, I, I do get it honestly. You've seen a snapshot of my family already. But, but we come from a long and, and distinguished line of, of generations of poor losers and people who want to win at all costs. You know, it's been born and bred into my family, and I have learned well the lessons of my elders. And so whether it's full contact Monopoly or Scrabble or whatever else that we play in the Steen family, it's always serious business. But where this competitive streak has come out the most and where it's most visible is typically during my family's annual pilgrimage to the Outer Banks of North Carolina around Thanksgiving time. It's there that, that we play the, the most intense games of hearts that you've ever seen. Now, traditionally in, in the Steen family, the goal of the game of hearts is, is not to win. It's to make sure that everybody else loses. There's a difference there. The goal is to make that, that, that vein in my grandfather's head start throbbing. The goal is to make my sister sit quietly and grind her teeth and mumble incoherent thoughts. The goal is to make my father tell everybody sitting at the table that they don't play the game right and it's their fault that Matt's winning again. And sometimes... Well, if we're, actually, if we're honest, most times I'll get so caught up in the game and making sure that everyone else loses that I might go a little overboard with smack talking or making jokes that I think are hilarious or doing my best to hold back peals of laughter when something in, bad happens to one of my competitors, you know, and you start to do that shake. You've done it before most times in church. <laughs> one year, a, um, a former and soon-to-be ex-girlfriend joined us for the week in, 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 in the Outer Banks and made the unfortunate decision to join us at the hearts table. Yeah, you probably see where this is going. I was having the game of my life. I could do no wrong. She, on the other hand, was not doing so well. And somewhere in the back of my head, I heard this little voice saying, danger, danger, you probably don't need to win this game. But everything else in my body took over and ignored that voice. And so I, I watched as my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend was becoming more and more frustrated and her face was getting redder and redder. And the final straw was when I played my last card, which gave her just enough points not only to, be, to lose the game, but also to be the loser of all the games. And I sat there and I, and I was shaking because I was trying to hold back the laughter. And I'm not going to say that that ended our relationship. I'm not going to say that when she stormed away from the table, you know, muttering under her breath that that was the end of our relationship. But it was probably the beginning. <laughs> and so as I look back, now that I've had some years to think through this, I, I realize that I probably could have handled that better. As I look back, I, I, I probably, 
I probably didn't need to win so bad. As I look back, I, I probably should have been more concerned with the relationship than I was with who got stuck with the queen of spades that time. But I was so focused on my goal that I forgot about preserving the relationship. I think what, what Paul knew then and what I've come to learn the hard way is that when we get so focused on something like winning or correcting that we can forget that the way that we do things can matter just as much as what we're doing. What, what Paul knew and what Paul was reminding Timothy of is that we can be right in what we're attempting to do, but if we go about it in the wrong way, we're still wrong. In other words, our, our orthopraxy needs to match our orthodoxy. Or in English, our um, correct teaching needs to be exhibited through correct practice. When we're called to correct error, our goal needs to be love. Were Paul with us this morning? Or if, if Paul were writing a, an epistle to the church in Orlando, I, I think he might be reminding us of this. I, I believe that he would be looking around at the current state of the affairs in the, in the capital C church and in, in the world we live in, and, and he would call us to be aware of those teaching a false gospel and call us to correct them while continuing to remind us that the ultimate goal is love. And so if we look at the world around us, if we look at the state of the capital C church right now, most of us would agree that, that, that yeah, Paul probably would be calling us to this. But the initial, the, the, the reaction that takes place after affirming that initial thought is a sinking feeling. And we start to say, but how do we do that? And, and so in the time I've got remaining this morning, which I think is a couple hours, um, in the time I've got remaining this morning, I, I want to address a couple of ways that I think we can do that. The first is intentional consumption. The second is humanizing the debate, okay? Intentional consumption and humanizing the debate. So let's start with uh, intentional consumption, shall we? So in 1826... The phrase, you are what you eat, was born. It was a French author who was doing a study on gastronomy. And the phrase he used was, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you what you are. Or at least the French equivalent of that. I think that statement has made sense for a lot of us, right? And, and it's held up for some time. But I think over the last 30 years ago or so, I think we probably are in a place where we probably should start to modify it a little bit. Okay. I think it's become a little bit more outdated. And so as our society has become one of media consumers, I'd suggest that we adjust the old phrase to go something like this. Tell me what you watch or who you listen to, and I'll tell you what you are. Or put more simply, you are the media you consume. We live in a culture trains us to believe that people who disagree with us are evil. It's black or white. There's very little gray. The prominent voices in our society thrive on division. They thrive on labeling. They thrive on attacking the other. If you spend any time listening to talk radio or cable news, you, you've, you've seen it. Certain groups of people, right, they want to, uh, they, they hate America, they want to destroy our way of life, and they want to silence the church, while, while there's other groups who are evil racists who are attempting to take back, you know, take us back to the bad old days. And we as a society, we as a, we as a society have gotten into this habit of labeling people based on the media they consume, and these labels determine whether they're good or evil. I don't know that this is helpful. And I don't think that Paul would think it's helpful either. Because Paul, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul tells us this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, or admirable, anything that's excellent and praiseworthy, think on those things. In other words, in other words, let's be mindful of what we're consuming. 
Let's be mindful of the voices that we allow into our heads and into our hearts. Because those things, they affect us more deeply than we know. About 15 years ago, I, um, <laughs> I was a talk radio junkie. and I love the cable news. I had a radio in my office. I was tuned to a talk station, and, and, and all day long, people were railing on the politics of those people in that party. I'd go home, and the, and the talking heads on the cable news station would be railing and arguing and, and screaming about how those people in that party are trying to ruin America. And slowly, over a period of several months, I started to notice that I was always on edge. I began to... I began to notice that I was dividing people into groups. I judged their intelligence and their likability based on whether they agreed with me or not. And I, and I began to notice that I was quick to jump into an argument whenever I had the chance. Now, I know I'm the only one that struggles with this because, I mean, Josh Plant's your pastor, so uh, this morning I guess I'm preaching to myself more than anything. But, but at that time and over the course of several months, God started to work on me and say, hey, you know, you might want to consider what you're listening to here. And so I decided to, to see how the stimuli that I was consuming affected my attitudes and my anxiety. And so I, became to be, I began to be a little bit more intentional about the things that I read and the things that I watched and the things that I listened to. And I shifted away from talk radio and cable news to, to more sports radio and ESPN. And I noticed a significant change. After a few weeks, I was less anxious. I was less argumentative. I, 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 I changed, started to change how I labeled people in my head. I also became more depressed because I'm an Orioles fan and I'm a fan of that abomination of a football team in Washington, D.C. And, and there's never any joy in Mudville for my teams, except for maybe the Capitals and they're a hockey team but most people in America don't, don't think hockey's a sport. But I, I ultimately, seriously, I ultimately moved away from sports radio as well so that I could be more intentional about what I was putting into my mind. And so I still consume news. I still follow my teams. I'm still aware of what's going on in the world around me. But I've cut off those sources that inject anxiety and fear and anger into my daily rhythms. And so this week, I, I, I would encourage you to take note of the content that you're consuming. Ask yourself, is this true? Is this noble? Is this right, pure, lovely, and admirable? Ad admirable, that's a tough one. If you're unsure, I'd encourage you to take a, take a look at it through the lens of the fruits of the Spirit. And so in, in Galatians 5, and 23, Paul tells us this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's what I encourage you to ask yourself. Am I more loving and kind and gentle because of what I'm consuming? Or does this content encourage me to judge, hate, label, or despise others? Paul might suggest that content that encourages to us to judge or hate or label and despise as a false gospel. As followers of Christ, we're to be known for how we love others, not how we judge, not how we, how we label, not how we despise. We're called to leave the 99 in order to chase down the one, not to, not to talk about how the one should be more responsible in their choices or mock them with our friends. We're called to love immigrants and citizens. We're called to love Republicans and Democrats, the rich and the poor, the black and the white, pro-life and pro-choice. But when we are constantly bombarded with messages about how that other group is trying to destroy our country, it's nearly impossible to do so, isn't it? So this week, I, I, I challenge all of us, myself included, take some time. Intentionally take note of the content that you're consuming and ask yourself, would Jesus agree with this? Is he okay with what the creator of this content is calling you to do? I'm convinced that the more that we become intentional about what we consume,
the more that we, we filter it through the fruit of the Spirit, the easier it becomes to humanize the debates that we have with one another. A while back, I, um, I read an interview with uh, Tim Keller, who's a pastor in New York City, and he was asked about how he interacts with those with whom he has major disagreements, whether they be theological disagreements, political disagreements, cultural disagreements. And his response was that he first had to remind himself continuously that the person in question was created in the image of God. Continually, he had to remind himself that the person in question was created in the image of God. I, um, I wish he hadn't said that. Really. Because if I remind myself that the person who disagrees, me, disagrees with me is created in God's image, it forces me to remember that they're a human just like me. It forces me to remember that, that, that like me, they come up short from time to time. It forces me to remember that God loves them just as much as he loves me. And because of that, I need to be gracious and kind and empathetic with those that I disagree with us. And if we're honest and if we look at the world around us, the world around us thinks that's nuts, doesn't it? So many years ago, Paul reminded Timothy that his job was to remain in Ephesus. And his job was to, to, was to work to end the false teachings of the day. And to correct people with the love of Christ. He was called to love those false teachers. He was called not to score points, not to own anybody. He was called to love them and reconcile them with Jesus Christ our Savior. And so this morning, I think we're being called to something similar. I think we're being called to, 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 to challenge the false teachings that we encounter. I think we're called to remind ourselves that the goal of this calling is love. And so this morning, as our, as our time draws to a close, I, I, I want to give you some homework. And as you kind of grumble under your breath, remember, I'm created in the image of God too. <laughs> but this week, take some time. Intentionally observe the content that you're consuming. And ask yourself these three things. Is, is the fruit of this content love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control? Would Jesus approve of and agree with what the creator of this content is calling me to do? Is this content reminding me that the people with whom I disagree are also made in the image of God. Then take the bold step of asking God to help you make wise choices when it comes to what you consume. Will you, will you pray with me? Will you pray with me this morning? Father, um, this morning, this morning, Lord, I'm grateful. Father, I'm grateful for, for placing each of us here in such a time as this. Father, we're, we're, we're grateful that your word guides us and teaches us how to interact with those that we love and agree with and those who we, we might not. Father, Father, we're grateful that regardless of what happens in this world, that you've already won. And so, Father, this week, I, I pray that you will grant us wisdom. Wisdom, Lord, to know what voices that we should be listening to. Father, I pray that you will, you will grant us courage to love those who the world calls us to hate. And Father, I, I pray that you will grant us endurance to pursue the calling that you've placed on us wherever it might take us. Father, this morning we are grateful for your love for us. We're grateful for the work that you're doing in each of our lives. Grateful for the work that you're doing in this church and grateful for what you're about.